Ta! Ah. <laughs> good evening, good evening, good evening once again. Here we are, back, painfully on a stick. Uh, not necessarily the podcast, painfully on us live. We're here right now. We've got we've got people who are in the chat who are talking to us. We got Jermaine. I saw Genosis, Snowman, The Metal Life, Jermaine, All Dad Tech is here. Of course, Brian Blair Raul is with us. Uh, let's see, Babaluno. I like that Babaluno. Uh, and Theron Ware are, are all chatting with us right now. Troy, Khalil, everybody's here. So, yes, it is uh, It is Tuesday. It is time, once again, to talk about things on Tuesday, the painfully honest tech way. Uh, today has been kind of a crazy day. I've been trying to get a bunch of stuff done. I've been trying to get a bunch of stuff done, and in true getting stuff done fashion, I have not really been able to get anything done. But today, I filmed the principal photography of three videos. Uh, I am in the process of finding a an editor. And um, and I'm going to have that editor edit those videos, and I'm going to talk about stuff tonight on the podcast, which may end up – I keep – okay, it's a podcast, whatever. I'm going to talk about stuff tonight that may or may not uh, turn into, turn into um, little – nuggets of content on the youtube channel so so yeah everything's good how's everybody else doing out there this evening um i am feeling i'm feeling just generally like very is there ever a time that i don't feel generally very tired i don't think that there is but i try i keep trying last week i got out and i went for a walk twice and then this week it's back to like there's snow outside and it's cold and uh yeah ivan good to see you orbit airsoft and tech good to see you as well um it's been a it's been a crazy <laughs> i don't know so i i i'm back i don't know what that beeping sound is no idea what that beeping sound is uh what is it is it you shut up okay so i just had to like run out i was trying to get my cam link to work on my macbook Ooh, alt dad tech with the 1999 super chat thank you my friend thank you very much we are on the hype train the hype train is leaving the station as it were and um and yeah so i i couldn't get the m1 macbook has been has been really solid it's been doing really well these past few weeks that i've been using it as my like my my just video only machine but in the past a week or so it's just started to get all kind of weird and not really want to do any of the things that i needed to do so i was trying to get it to to see the video and it wasn't seeing the video and i ran upstairs and i got my my razor uh my razor blade 15 brought it down here plugged it in boom everything automatically worked and uh i was ready to go so <laughs> i, I I don't know. Am I off the Apple hype train? I don't. Am I? I don't know. It just. It seems like, just when you think you've got a good thing going, uh, things just don't work all that well anymore. So I, in fact, I was so flustered that I poured myself a, a, a carafe of water and forgot it. Forgot it somewhere. So, <laughs> thus are the days of our lives. Um, so yeah. Hey, if you don't follow me on the Twitter then maybe you want to go over there and do that. Uh, Jason T. Lewis, PhD. I, what is the what is the stupid beeping? Can you guys hear the beeping? It's really annoying. I don't know where it's coming from. And it's really annoying. That's the only problem that I have right now. If that's the worst problem that I have, then I guess we're doing okay. Um, so uh, what's been going on in Painfully Honest World? I only did one live stream last week, which, you know, I was meaning to do more live streams than that. But, um, you know, in true Painfully Honest fashion, things got a little crazy. Went out and bought a uh, another vehicle. Bought another vehicle. Uh, so I, I always have this. It's like the computers, the best laid plans of mice and men when it comes to vehicles. Uh, well, good. I'm glad you can't hear the beeping. I don't know what's causing it. So good. Um, so I have an Audi A4 that I don't really drive all that much because I work at home and I don't have anywhere to go because it's like pandemic time. Uh, and I haven't really used the Audi. I, I haven't really used the Audi all that much at all. And, uh, in fact, I've had the Audi since I think it's two years now, just about two years. 
and I've put 5,000 miles on it. So my wife works in Cedar Rapids, which is you know, 45 minutes away or so. So she's always, um, she's always driving and she was driving our Jeep Cherokee, which gets crappy gas mileage. And so we just kind of did a little bit. We have a Chevy Volt as well. That is supposed to be my daughter's car, but because she is, it hasn't yet got her driver's license yet. And she couldn't take driver's ed because the pandemic, uh, and I am not, I'm not patient enough to, uh, <laughs> I'm not, well, no, it's not that I'm not patient enough. I, I just would rather her take driving lessons from a professional, uh, who's not going to lose his temper. Um, so <laughs> I can I can be somewhat harsh. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, yes, Audi Quattro A4 Quattro 2017. Um, very nice, it's a super nice car. I like it a lot. Um, but uh, we we had the Volt wouldn't start. We left it sitting outside for a year. Guess what? It wouldn't start. So so we had to have it we had to have it towed to the Chevy dealership where they changed out the 12 volt battery. Everything else was fine, but they you know that needs new tires, blah, blah, blah. So that got us in the like, should, what should we do with the car situation? Somehow we went from getting rid of the Volt to uh, getting rid of the Volt to buying my wife a BMW. <laughs> and we can't get rid of the, we can't get rid of the Jeep as much as, as I would love to get rid of the Jeep. We can't get rid of the Jeep because the Jeep, we're like stupid upside down on the Jeep. Never buy never buy a car that's going to lose that much value off the lot because you're immediately upside down on your loan and you'll never get out from under that car, uh, forever. Um, well, is 69 Mach one with a 428. I mean, are you, are you like commuting in that car? Cause that's, that's quite a commuter. Uh, but yeah, there's just, there's just this whole thing about buying cars. It took me years to realize that buying cars, uh, especially buying cars that won't hold their value is stupid. Um, and so one thing that I learned, and, and one, one thing that helped me learn this lesson is that the Audi that we bought two years ago, uh, we bought, God, I think we paid like $26,000 for it. We can still sell it in a private sale for more than what we own it now. Whereas the Jeep, uh, we're we're like several thousand dollars upside down on the cheap. So little car buying lesson: don't buy cars that depreciate quickly. Um, now the BMW actually was a stupid, stupidly good deal. Um, it's a it's a BMW 330e. So the 330e is a BMW 330 with a plug-in hybrid battery engine attached. So so yeah, you can plug it in. It gets like 20 miles, 20 miles or so when you plug it in, uh, just on the, on the, uh, on the battery alone, but it works like a Prius. Not it, it works like a Prius where the, the electric battery helps the gas motor and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, um, it, it is a, it is a very nice car and I'm kind of jealous that it belongs to the wife, <laughs> kind of jealous that it belongs to the wife but it does she deserves it she got a big old uh she got a big old new job not long ago and um and so she gets the executive saloon as they would call it in britain and i'm 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 happy about it i'm happy about it but we now we have four cars which is there are three of us and only two of us drive and one of us doesn't ever leave the house so audi for sale <laughs> If anybody wants to buy the Audi, all dad tech got the Audi Q5. Nice. Nice. Those are, those are pretty sweet. Um, yeah, the Audi, the Audi is a very nice car, but I have to say, having gotten used to driving the Audi and then getting it first, we were driving a Prius, um, prime, uh, that we were checking that out and it gets 600 miles to the gas tank, which is crazy, but we had an we had an original like not the original prius but like the the first weird looking prius we had one of those i think it was a 2005 or something like that and um and we we I, that car it was like driving it was like driving a bread box it was the most blah driving experience ever in the world but 
but it, it had its own sort of charm, right? It had its own sort of charm. Driving this Prius Prime, it's a 2018, no, 2000, yeah, 2018 Prius Prime. And it was a nice car, but also just as boring. Uh, and so, like, you know, you just don't really want to. And yeah, so I saw that they had the BMW. And we did think about the Tesla. We did think about the Tesla. Now, Model S, outside of the price range uh, of of yet of the poor YouTube man that I am, um, but but yeah, we definitely. I looked at the Teslas. I priced the Teslas. I I kind of figured out how we could buy a Tesla, and then we went to the Tesla map. I didn't look. I I last looked at Teslas when we bought the Audi, so two years ago. And and it was when the Model Three was just coming around, so I was like, okay, I, I'll I'll check, I'll I'll look at the Teslas. Problem is that when you look at the Tesla Supercharger map, um, you find that there is a Tesla Super one Tesla Supercharger station in Iowa City where I live. There's like two in Cedar Rapids. That's 45 minutes away. And then the next supercharger is two and a half hours away in, in Des Moines. And there just aren't enough supercharging stations in this part of the country to make it make sense to buy a Tesla if you have to travel outside of like, if you have to travel as a, as a regular thing. You know, so, so my wife was nervous about getting an all electric car with not really that much support going on behind it. Um, but yeah, we want, I wanted a Tesla really bad. And, and I did hear about Tesla not having, um, not having Apple CarPlay or Android auto, but it does have, I guess it has like native Spotify. I, I don't know. Um, I have to figure. I mean, it has to have Bluetooth, right? But that 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 center console dash thingy th that they've got is pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, I th I think we could have gotten into into a Tesla. the pa The payments might uh, the payments would have been okay, but it just wouldn't have just wouldn't have made any sense in terms of what kind of driving we had to do. Toyotas, Hondas, Luis is right. I mean, Toyotas and Hondas. Uh, hold their value really well. I was surprised how well um, how well the Audi held its value. Um, the thing that I the thing that I found is the best thing to do, and you do have to be careful when you do this. But the thing that I found is best to do is look at a car that's like two or three years old that's that's used, because um, those are cars that are just coming off of um, that are just coming off of lease. Now, some people treat their lease cars like crap. And so you have to look out for that, but you can get a pretty good, like the, the Audi that we got when we got the Audi, I think it had 21,000 miles on it. This, uh, this BMW that we just got has 18,000 miles on it. And so you can get a really good deal on a car, but so we, you know, I think I think the luxury, or like the low the the mid tier luxury sedan is is a good place to go if you want a car that's gonna that's gonna be good for you for a while. Uh, the only thing you, you want to be careful of is once you're out of warranty, once you're five or six years down the road, uh, you know, the, the repairs can be expensive. So anyway, we we bought this we bought this uh, BMW. It's black with a black leather interior. I mean, it's everything that I want a car to be, and uh, <laughs> but it's not mine. Um, all dad tag, four ninety nine super chat. Thank you. The wife has the twenty eighteen X five, but you prefer the BMW. Uh, I have to say, the driving experience of of the BMW was was quite sweet. Uh, we brought it home for an evening. I will also never buy a car again without bringing it home before I drive it. Uh, and and like keeping it overnight because I I probably would have bought that uh, that Prius, but I slept on it overnight. We drove it again in the morning. It just was kind of boring anyway. So we spent 18, 19 minutes of the podcast talking about buying a car. That's not what I came here to talk about. But that was the big news in painfully honest tech world this week. Uh, other big news. Other big news includes. 
the fact that Apple is suing a guy that used to work for them. Uh, he was a pretty high up in the in the in the whole Apple ecosystem guy. Um, let's see. Now, all of this, of course, is alleged because the guy has been they're suing him, but he hasn't been, you know. So anyway, Simon Lancaster is the guy's name. Um, he was a materials lead at Apple, accused of accessing outside accessing data outside his job scope and then selling it to a media outlet. I was so scared. <laughs> I was so when I saw actually I saw Rene Ritchie's video and I saw his thumbnail and I was like, please don't let this be John Prosser. Please, <laughs> please don't let it be John Prosser. I was I was so scared that it was John Prosser. But the way that everything is 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 sort of worded in this makes it sound like it was uh, it, not well, maybe not a print publication, but a publication um, that was words and not video or audio, right? So, <laughs> what's my painfully honest bracket? WVU all the way to the championship, as always. That's my bracket. If WVU's in the show, I, I can't even I can't even do it. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but but yeah, so so Apple Apple, I guess, okay, let's see what it says here. Despite over a decade of employment at Apple, Lancaster abused its position and trust within the company to systematically disseminate Apple's sensitive trade secret information in an effort to obtain personal benefits. He used his seniority to gain access to internal meetings and documents outside the scope of his job's responsibilities containing Apple's trade secrets. He then provided these trade secrets to outside to his outside media correspondent. Now, I can't understand. This is what I can't understand. The people who leak this kind this information from from companies like Apple, they are taking like a pretty significant risk, right? And as far as I know, um as far as I know, like they're not getting paid tons of money to give this information to anybody, right? So like, what is the incentive for leaking this information? Um, so, so this guy, he, he left Apple, but before he left Apple, he even went back into Apple and like took more stuff. Um, and so let's see, he left Apple and joined a materials research company called Eris. He described his departure as needing to scratch a startup itch, um, on his LinkedIn page. <laughs> Apple says Eris is an Apple vendor, which enabled Lancaster to, to continue to siphon trade secrets away from Apple. Um, it's that to me, that's crazy. Now we don't know who his source was. He's the only person that's been named in this. Uh, he downloaded a substantial number of documents, confidential Apple documents uh, from his personal corporate computer and the corporate network uh, that would benefit him at his new job. So I see where, I guess there was a startup that he was trying to get going and, and that startup was, you know, he wanted this uh, media correspondent to cover this startup favorably or something like that. It just seems like there are less risky ways to do that. And, uh, and th to me, it's insane to me. It's insane. And, and to go to the, the lengths that this guy's gone to. And now do you guys remember, I think it was the iPhone four way back, way, way back um, in, in the old days when Apple was super duper secretive and he never knew anything about anything. Uh, somebody accidentally left an iPhone four prototype at a bar and a, and a, and a guy who worked for one of the tech, uh, tech blogs, uh, oh, geez, I, I, I didn't look this up, so I don't know all the details, but a guy who worked for one of the, uh, one of the tech blogs, maybe you guys can fill me in if you remember the story, found the iPhone prototype and sold it to, um, sold it to sold it to somebody who then like you know leaked leaked it all over the place and apple basically like i don't know they they put out a strike force coming after this guy um <laughs> and yeah it's crazy it it, it was crazy how and they came to his house they came to this guy's house and was like give us the phone <laughs> and 
it's gone from from that to uh, to now. They've got people that that work. Maybe this happens more often than I really even know. They've got people working there who are siphoning off all this information, um, and and just like giving it away. Uh, was it Gizmodo? Okay, Gizmodo. Um, yeah, yeah. Apple almost disappeared. This guy. I can't even. I can't even imagine. Like I remember. I think it was last year when John Prosser was getting a lot of different information about Apple stuff. And I guess in some, in some like media briefing, Tim Cook was like, does anyone know this John Prosser guy? And uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, that, that, that would personally like freak me out, but I don't, I have no idea how John gets his information. I have no idea how any of these leakers get this information. I know I have no idea how you like, how you, petition to get it i n no clue no clue steve steve jobs was really pissed about that iphone uh that iphone thing and i remember i think it was the iphone 10 when the iphone 10 was on its way to to the market some dude that worked at apple high up high up dude at apple brought his daughter to his office and they were having lunch and she like took a selfie or something and it showed the phone and that guy got shit canned. I mean, <laughs> it, uh, I, yeah. So, so I don't, it seems to me now here's the thing about being a leaker or being someone who reports leaks. It becomes, a, it becomes something that is like, it's a feast or famine. Like if you lose your sources as someone who reports leaks, right? If you lose a source or, or, you know, the information dries up for one reason or another, then you are totally effed. You, I mean, unless you have all kinds of sources backing up the sources that, that you, that you had, then your entire career becomes like, you're no longer like so-and-so, the guy who does this thing and you know, you can, and you have any sort of mobility one way or the other, um, you become the guy who leaks the stuff. And I don't know, that seems to me like a, like just a really weird, a really difficult career moment. Um, so yeah, I, with this guy, I, I just can't even imagine what, what it would be like to to just realize that uh, what what is Apple going to get out of suing this guy? Uh, let, let's see here. So he was he worked for Apple until November first of twenty nineteen. Uh, media correspondent first contacted him in twenty eighteen, almost a year before. Um, he was a twelve year veteran of Apple and he, he shared document labeled confidential with to the correspondent. I guess some of it was air tags. Some of it was Apple glass. Some of it possibly was AirPods max. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, at this point we can read the court documents that have been filed in the United States district court of Northern California, uh, Northern district of California, San Jose division. We can read the stuff and uh and and kind of read between the lines a little bit but we we don't know anything for sure although the first comment <laughs> the first comment on this story this is a story from apple insider the first comment is uh so now we know where john prosser gets his info uh <laughs> oh man um so and and the next the next comment is such a shame. Is there a GoFundMe page to contribute to the a to Apple's suit against this guy? Oh, okay. So they want to. Why would you want to contribute to Apple? Apple is <laughs> a trillion dollar company. Um, wow. Now I could see I could see if you were getting rich, but I I, I mean I don't think this guy was getting rich, right? He was just. He just was leaking this information, maybe in the hopes that some good press would help his his startup company. That I don't know. All I know is it seems 
really ridiculous. Apple requests the court provide judgment in its favor for injunctive relief, damages proven at trial, punitive damages, restitution at costs of the lawsuit. Apple also demands a trial by jury. Woo! Woo! Man, would you want to sit across the courtroom from, from Tim Cook and have him say good morning to you? I don't know that I would. Um, I mean, Johnny G, now this is not fake news because, I mean, we have, we have a court document that states these things in detail. What it means, we don't, I, I mean, we don't know all the who's, what's, and when's, and how's, and, and all that kind of stuff. But we do know that it's a real deal because this is a public document that was filed in the, the Northern District of California, San Jose Division District Court of the United States. So, good morning. I'm going to I'm going to sue your ass today and you won't leave here with pants. So we've got we've got that. And I I really hope that it's not anybody that we know who has anything any connection to this. It didn't again the documents make it sound like it was it was uh written and not and not like video or audio related uh, but still, I, who who really knows? <laughs> He'll be sent to the Apple Gulag in China and and made to <laughs> made to produce iPhones. Well, I mean, you know, he could he could just yeah. He'll be he'll be there in the in the Foxconn plant at Shenzhen, uh, and he will just uh, and he will just uh, he'll just have to assemble iPhones and you know, if it gets too bad, he'll jump off the building and land in the nets. Just, you know, that that's just the way it is tech for your needs. Um, so yeah, I do have two live streams going on in, uh, on YouTube right now that thank you for reminding me. So there has always been this sort of, I guess they're just like legends or myths. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody can ever get um, nobody can ever get real information about what happens on YouTube, but there's always been this this sort of uh, urban legend that live streaming on your channel where you release videos can be detrimental to the algorithm looking at your channel. Some people some people live stream on their channel and seems to have no problems whatsoever. Um, it's probably not a big deal, but. Uh, I do. I did start a while back, a long while back, maybe a year plus ago. Uh, Painfully honest live channel, and so it's been suggested to me again that I try separating the live streams from the channel, and I'm gonna start doing these live streams over on Painfully Honest Live now. Right now, because of our generous sponsor, Restream. I am able to stream both to my regular YouTube channel and to Painfully Honest Live at the same time. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, yeah, I know. I know. Rich makes his living live streaming. I gotta. I gotta talk to Rich from Review Tech USA and find out more about about what kind of see. Cause he works some kind of magic, and I look at Rich's channel and and this channel as somewhat similar not necessarily the same but somewhat similar and he's gone through a lot of different a lot of different content and style uh permutations and i feel and i'm going through you know sort of the same thing at this point as well so i'm, I'm curious i want to talk to rich and find out more about uh about his journey from one thing to the next but i do think i'm going to try the live channel for a while and and just let this channel be like the the destination for the edited curated videos uh so if you're if you're not subscribed to the painfully honest live channel then by all means go over there and uh and and hit that subscribe button hit that, hit that bell notification let yourself know whenever there's going to be uh whenever there's going to be a new a new live stream and uh because I also want to be able to just go live whenever I feel like it. And <laughs> sometimes I feel like going live, but you know, it's like I'm planning, I'm planning a video and I don't want to do two things like so close together. So this will let me go live whenever I feel like it um, and, and do more hangouts and do more, you know, whatever. So subscribe over there at painfully honest 
live and uh yeah well that'll be that'll be good now so michael's saying yeah i've got a I got a boost in my views and subscribers since I started back with going live on my main channel. Really, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> that's that's really interesting. Uh, I mean, I've I've just when I think I notice a pattern, uh, it 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 turns around and it's something and it's different. Um, I I I feel like I have like. I was getting. I had a. I had a video to do really well last week, um, and I was moving up and gaining subscribers. And then, like last week, when I did a, a live stream, a couple of live streams or whatever, it, the subscribers went. I, I. I can't figure it out. I don't. It's not that I care about subscriber numbers per se. I appreciate anybody who subscribes to the channel, but I'm not like looking for a specific number that's going to tell me, oh, you know, once I get to X subscribers, then I'm this, that, or the other thing. That's not necessarily what I'm looking at, but I, I'm looking at the subscriber numbers, at the view counts, at, at different things as like, as, as just like barometers for um, what, it, whatever it is, you know, it's like, are the subscriber numbers going up? Are they going down? You know, does that mean that things are going well? I, I've been doing this now for a bunch of years and for some reason, um, for some reason, I still can't figure it out. Now, Fat Produce with a $2 super chat has a very interesting question. And LMR, Luke, my daughter has people over. I'm sorry about this, but my daughter has people over and we have one dog that if there's a, if there's like a, a different person in the house that doesn't belong here, will not shut up. I don't know if you guys can hear the dog, but it's annoying. It's it's putting me on edge. It's putting it's setting my teeth on edge, as they say. Um, LMR Lucas says that I'm the most handsome, sexy YouTuber in the world. In the world, that's 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 excessive. I don't believe that's true. Um, there are plenty more handsome YouTubers than myself, but I appreciate the sentiment nonetheless. Uh, so fat produce with the super chat says, what retro tech do I still use today? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, let's see. I know there's something. Uh, I, does a CD player count? Uh, does a record player, like a record player count? Cause I, I think I, th yeah, I still use those. I've got, I've got this, <laughs> This uh, 11 rack that is now like really old and, and no longer supported. So I guess, but I'm, I'm getting rid of that because I, I, I got a line six helix if you know, and it's stupid, stupid, it's stupid expensive and it's way more than I need. So I don't, I, I don't know. I think I'm going to take it back and get something for dumb people because when it comes to guitar stuff, I'm really dumb. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, I'm sure there's other stuff, um, that I'm just not thinking of right now. Does a Kindle count? I mean, I've got a, it's a new Kindle. It's a Kindle Oasis, but the, the, the whole philosophy behind the Kindle is, is not as, uh, <laughs> is not as, uh, it's, you know, the single use device is outdated, right? So an old iron like this one? Yes. This is a sad iron. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I've ever told you guys uh, the stories, the story behind this. This was my grandmother's, uh, gr my grandmother's family. And it had, it has like a separate handle that you put on it and you heat it up on the, on the, on the iron stove, like, and then you pick it up with the handle and that's how you iron your clothes. This thing weighs probably 10 pounds and uh it had an asbestos sleeve that went over it so that you didn't burn yourself <laughs> um so my my media company is called sad iron media my band is called sad iron music uh, my studio is called sad iron studios um there's just something about that phrase sad iron that 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 sort of tickles me so I just I just keep using it and sad. I looked this up one time. I think it was on a live stream. I, I sad didn't only mean like you know 
emotionally not feeling happy, but um, it's it, it meant it's, it had some connotation to like weight, I believe, or something like that. I'll look it up again and, and let you guys know. Uh, so do I collect vinyl records? Uh, yeah, I mean, I always have. I've got I've got a cup. I've got a thing back there that has um, uh, that has probably a couple of hundred records in it. I I my collection is ballooned and then and then like you know, sort of cut down again over the years. Uh, I have a whole thing about music if you guys didn't listen to the painfully honest podcast uh the painfully honest with with jason t lewis podcast my new podcast that's available through the empire podcasting network over wherever you get your podcasts i talked about whether um whether music had okay let me let me put it in not in some kind of um okay let me let me put it in in non-passive voice uh has music has have live streaming ser or streaming services destroyed music? Um, and, and the answer for me is partially yes. Um, because the way that I listen to music has been fundamentally changed by the existence of these streaming services, right? So now it's, it's much, it's much easier to like go to Apple music or go to Spotify or go to wherever and have like, you know, you see a playlist, like you want to listen to Van Morrison, let's say, and you know that you love the Tupelo Honey record, right? But whenever you search Van Morrison, Apple Music says Van Morrison Essentials, and you know that the songs that you like from Tupelo Honey are going to be in there. So you just listen to the Van Morrison Essentials. And that's that, even that is... <laughs> Is, is like more directed than a lot of times. Like a lot of times I'll just press the, uh, I'll, I'll just press play on the Jason Lewis station that Apple music has. Um, I, and usually it plays stuff that, that I, that I like, uh, or that I haven't heard forever. They played the volcano. Sun. Apple music played the volcano sons on my, on my <laughs> media device the other day and the volcano sons, were such a good band. I don't know if they still. I don't know if they're still playing, but they they were a punk band in the in the eighties and nineties. And uh, man, they were so good. They came and played uh, the club that I used to hang out in all the time. And man, yeah, Volcano Sons. And I hadn't heard the Volcano Sons in twenty years, probably. So that that was really really good. I was I was glad. Okay, so Alejandro has looked up the sad thing. So it comes from the old English meaning weighty, hefty, or dense. Yes, I knew it had something to do with that. And so, uh, so yeah, thank you for looking that up, Alejandro. Much appreciated. So, yeah, the sad iron uh, is, is just based on that. And, man, this, this is also like a personal defense weapon. Uh, <laughs> that's how I judge everything. Could I defend myself? effectively with this or this set of headphones or or whatever uh that that is the ultimate arbiter of whether or not a piece of technology is good um <laughs> you can only <laughs> there is there a dollar general podcast network i i mean you know I, it doesn't cost you anything to subscribe to the podcasts it doesn't cost you anything um But yeah, I would imagine like vinyl is getting more difficult now. I remember when I first, well, I mean, so vinyl was kind of on its way out as, as like the media for music when I was, when I was, you know, graduating from high school, the CD was coming in and all that kind of stuff. And so over the years, I still just, I would go and buy vinyl here and there and, and, you know, if, if I if there was a record I really liked, I might have it on vinyl and CD. Uh, if it was Michael Jackson's Thriller, I had it on uh, cassette, eight track, and uh, and LP. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I. But now it it dawns on me that like a lot of the stuff that you used to be able to get, just you know, going out and browsing the used the used record store shelves, a lot of that stuff isn't as available anymore as it uh as it would have been yeah not even 
not even like that long ago. So I'm kind of bummed that I have uh, sold a lot of my vinyl collection. Um, well, not a lot, but there are records that I that I sold that I still miss. I I went through a phase where we had a garage sale and I was like, I'm selling all the vinyl. I'm not going to carry this stuff around anymore. And uh, <laughs> and I I I didn't uh, I I sold like maybe. 10 or 20 records and then i felt and then i started to feel really bad about it so I, I took them down to the basement again and didn't sell them anymore but i sold like you know like a liz fair record that i didn't want to sell and uh, there were a few others that i really didn't want to sell um stability and chaos says uh losing personal enrichment with music on streaming services has to do with laziness the personal and personal weakness discipline is all it takes to make your music listening better than ever. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I used to admire the people who could like so intensely arrange their their MP3 collections and they'd have like all of the metadata in there and this is back in the day when the metadata wasn't just like sucked up from someplace on the internet and they had all these playlists and everything like that. I've I always admired those people, but I I came to understand once music streaming became a thing that I am, I'm kind of an emotional music listener. So I'll look at, I'll, I would look at my collection of CDs or records and I'd be like, what do I feel like listening today? And then I'd browse the spines and I'd grab something and I'd, and I'd put it on and, and that would be what I'd listen to. It wasn't really like super organized or anything. And so now when I go to listen to stuff on a streaming service, I can't, uh, I can't do the, just like browse the, the spines of the, of the records or CDs. Like you just have this long list of band names and then it's like, you know, they're interleaved into different folders and stuff. So it's not necessarily as, as fun or as, well, it's, it's not as easy to just let your emotions sort of grab the thing, right? So, no, I, th I think you're right that uh, with a little bit more fortitude, I, I, I could definitely have a much, a much richer experience listening to, listening to music. But usually, you know, if I'm, if I'm on the go, if I'm jumping in the car or something like that, um, I mean, there's always some kind of kerfuffle with like trying to get the Bluetooth to hook up or, or whatever. I just go like with the easiest thing to listen to. I should, I should try and do more, but I don't, I don't. And it's a drag. Um, yeah. And, and buying vinyl, like you're right. Um, Orbit says buying vinyl today is like highway robbery, bought an ACDC. Uh, yeah. Last yeah, for 80 bucks. Eesh. That's, that's crazy. Um, I mean, you know, there's, there's something to be said for buying high quality vinyl. Uh, cause yeah, it used to be that you could go to any flea market and get, get, you know, whatever ACDC record you wanted for 50 cents, but it, you know, it's like somebody's crappy copy that had been sitting around in a, in a basement for 30 years and smelled like mildew. Right. So, there's something to be said. Like I like reissues for that reason. You get you get more for your money. Although I have to say, um, these these new mixes that Giles Martin did of the Beatles of of those few Beatles records. What was it? Um, he did Abbey Road. He did the White Album, and he did Sgt. Pepper's. Right. And I have the Sgt. Pepper's remix, but I didn't buy the White Album. And I didn't buy, uh, I didn't buy Abbey Road and I want it like they're in my Amazon cart and I just didn't buy them. Now, if I, if I were in a record store and I saw those things, I would get that like oh, the little butterflies and I would, go, I would grab it and I would go to the, to the, I would go and buy it. But because I could get it from Amazon whenever it just sits in the cart and I don't get it. I mean, I, I have. I have, you know, mono and stereo Beatles box sets over there. And the new, the new mixes from Giles Martin are very, very good. The records sound really, really awesome, but I just haven't felt the, you know, that I had to go, go get them because I can listen to them on Spotify.
or Apple Music or whatever, right? So, so yeah, that's one thing. Like, and and Orbit's right. Thrift stores can be a great place to go get old records. I found that okay. So I lived in New York City for eleven years, and and when you live in New York, you kind of get used to the the whole idea that you can go anywhere and get anything at almost any time of the day. You just, you can just go do it. And then when you move to a mid-sized town like IO city, that's in the middle of nowhere, the closest, the, the closest big city that would have, that would be, you know, sort of an, an analog to New York is Chicago and Chicago is three plus hours away. And so um, you just end up, like I can't, I can't go to a record. I can't go to a record store, and I can't go to like a, an electronics store. I can't go to a musical instrument store. Uh, like the only musical instrument store anywhere near me. Well, there's there's a local one that's pretty cool, but they don't really stock anything. It's 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 more of like you know, you buy your supplies there, and they have some guitars. But you know, Guitar Center is in Cedar Rapids is the closest music store, like like instrument store, and it's terrible uh guitar center is like the saddest place on earth now because <laughs> uh, it, it because they're in bankruptcy and nobody who works there like they're all under 25 years old and nobody who works there actually really knows anything about any of the things that they're selling and it's just the saddest place on earth um i went to bleaker bobs many many times in fact bleaker bobs was one of the first places i went in new york city when i went with my high school girl my high school girlfriend's family was from brooklyn and so uh my senior year in high school she and her mom were going to visit family they took me with them and one of the first places that i went was you know, the west village bleaker bobs was one of the first record stores that i went into i you know and i think i i think it was at bleaker bobs that i bought a a a mobile fidelity copy of Abbey, uh, not Abbey Road, but the White Album. I have, I have like four good copies of the White Album right now. So, um, yeah, I, I miss me, I miss being able to to geek out about that stuff, man. I used to, I used to love like, you know, get a get a twelve pack or a case of beer, and a friend comes over, and you just listen to records, and you just you just geek out over over what you're listening to. Man, that was so awesome. Um, but you know so snowman says i agree 100 percent about guitar center i remember walking in a few months ago and they oh, they had all the instruments roped off uh, uh because of covid and what do you do when uh, that's exactly yeah that's absolutely true and and it's funny because i was in there i was in there two weeks ago to pick up this this like guitar thing and all of their gibsons and all of their upper upper echelon fender guitars were on the very top row like 10 feet off the ground and i and i stood there usually you can't get the people at guitar center to go away um you know like they'll bother you and bother you and bother you but i stood there for like 10 minutes, just kind of looking at everything that was on the wall. Nobody came up to me and said, Hey, do you want anything to, and maybe, maybe it was a COVID thing. Maybe it's just the fact that guitar center is, is like a dead store walking. Um, Alex, yes, we did get to the Apple suit thing. And basically there's an Apple insider. Uh, there's an Apple insider article that I can link in the, in the store, in the thingy right now put it in the chat for you but basically somebody who was a higher up at apple uh was leaking all kinds of stuff to uh to someone and and now apple's suing them for damages etc cetera, etc cetera. i would not want to get sued by apple uh if there are plenty of people to get sued by apple is not one of them um what do I expect from the so here's here's an intro here's a good question um no see whenever the chat moves my thing I, I end up hitting the thing that I don't want up there uh what do I expect about the iPhone 13 lineup this year I got I got to admit I haven't been I know that people have been talking about it I haven't really been paying attention all that much uh because I I hate 
leaks. I hate rumors. Every once in a while, I'll I'll report on something you know that's that's come out, uh, leak or rumor or whatever. Um, but for the most part, I try I try to ignore most of that stuff. But I think the iPhone 13, I, I really don't know. I don't think we're gonna. I don't think we're gonna see anything crazy. The, there have been stories that have said we're going to potentially see some sort of folding iPhone in, in 22 or 23. So I don't know that Apple's going to do anything all that big. I, I kind of just have this feeling that it's not going to be anything all that exciting. But, of course, I could be wrong. Um, maybe, a, maybe a smaller notch would be a nice thing. But tell, tell me true. Tell me true. Does anybody who uses an iPhone now really notice the notch anymore at all ever because i i don't i i, I don't um maybe okay I, I shouldn't say i don't i i should say that the only time i do is when i put my phone in landscape mode and and a video has been shot in two to one aspect ratio so that little portion is being cut out but usually videos are 16 by 9 and you don't lose anything so so yeah, I I don't I don't think that there's really anything at all uh, to to complain about. Although the notch, a smaller notch would be fine. The notch going away would be great. Um, there'll be new colors for sure. <laughs> um, man, man, I just keep whenever we talk about Apple and colors, I just keep thinking back to those proposed iMac colors that just seem like they would be so awful to me, but you know, um, so Genosa says that he, he notices the pixel fives punch hole more in landscape mode, uh, than when watching movies. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a good point. I kind of do like with the, with the galaxy note 21 that I'm still using right now. Um, I kind of, I kind of noticed the the hole punch more than I noticed the notch as well. Maybe it's just because it's a it's a it smaller real estate, and so it it just you know it's more noticeable. But at the same time, I I don't know I don't know. I just I just saw my friend Sarah Dici uh, made a video, and the title of the video is "I sold all my Bitcoin to buy a Tesla." There's something about finance in there that seems like a non-linear. I, I don't know because Tesla is a big thing and Bitcoin is a big thing. I am, man. I was thinking about getting into all that stuff, uh, and yes, I do want to invest money. I, I, I've tried to explain this to people before. Like when when you grow when you're poor or when you grew up poor, your relationship to money and and and, and thought of investing that money is like a lot weirder and a lot more messed up than if you if you you know came from a background where that was something that was normalized and so like investing my money has always been like a weird thing so uh and i still get i still get weirded out when i see people like putting actual dollar amounts of what they've what they've invested and what they've made on twitter that still seems odd to me but i i mentioned it before and nobody seemed to think that that it was all that big a deal um i i think siri uh, some improvements to siri as would be great as well i i'm i have a feeling that they've slowly been working on siri through the years um and i have noticed that when i try and interact with siri like even on the the home pod mini uh i get more of what i'm asking for than i ever had before um, so, so yeah, I, I think Siri, I kind of feel like all of the, the, the sort of virtual assistants are at like a, a standstill, like Google's there and it can do a lot of stuff. And yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's kind of do it. I don't know. They seem like they're waiting for the next thing, just like smartphones are waiting for the next thing. Uh, uh, like voice assistants are waiting for the next thing. I, I think that when, you know, Google assistant or Siri or 
or Alexa or whatever is implanted in your ear and you, could, you just talk to them, that will be, that will be like something else. But, um, but yeah. <laughs> um, so disappointed in MagSafe iPhone. So here's, here's the thing. I think that Mag, I think they made a big deal out of MagSafe and the, and the potential for all of these like accessories and all that kind of stuff. They, and, I don't think they ultimately they introduced MagSafe for one reason and one reason only, and it was not to sell more accessories. Although the more accessories they sell, the more they're the, the happier they are. They introduced MagSafe so that they could get rid of the Lightning port entirely and just charge charge via MagSafe. And and so I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised, although I don't think it's likely that we see the port go away, if not this year, then next year. That's, that's my thought right there. Um, and Bob has a good point here when it comes to investing money or gambling or any of those kinds of things. If you're, if you can't afford, I, I would say if you, if you can't afford to lose the money, then you probably shouldn't put it at risk. So that's, that's, that's the way that I kind of feel about it. Um, but, but yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, but it's it's also just an entire an entire thought process that I don't think is I don't think is as easily understood. Like I think I think people who grew up without money find it hard to relate to people who who maybe did and had those things as normal parts of their lives, and vice versa. I think that people who who, you know, to, to investing money, saving money, having cash on hand, that kind of thing. People who that's normal for in general, um, it's difficult for them to to put themselves in the in the headspace of somebody who, you know, spent most of their life living paycheck to paycheck. Um, so I, I there'll always be some kind of disconnect there. So wait, I, I want to see this. Ace says that uh, I Justine tried to buy her Tesla with Bitcoin when her car broke down. Um, no, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I, but you have to cash the Bitcoin in first, don't you? I mean, Bitcoin is supposed to be its own currency, but you can't buy anything with it. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. What, what car did she have that broke down? You would think that, I mean, she, she should be able to get it fixed, right? Yeah, John's right. Uh, one of the poverty traps is, you know, once once you once you get used to living hand to mouth, it doesn't matter how much is in your hand; it all goes in your mouth <laughs> until you're able to like recognize and break that cycle and and become somebody who sees. Who's able to see, you know, more longitudinally instead of more vertically? Um, it's really, it's really, it's really different. Yeah, I mean, you can buy Tesla with Bitcoin now. Okay, so well, that's good to know, because I don't have any Bitcoin and I don't have a Tesla. <laughs> Elmar, thank you for uh, thank you for stopping by. Much appreciated. Have a good evening in uh, in in Brazil. I appreciate you you uh, your your kind assessment of my of my looks. I appreciate it. Um, the last time I talked to I Justine about a car, she wanted one of those Ford Raptors. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what that's what we're talking about. Um, Orbit. She she put out a video, and I haven't I haven't watched the video. I just saw the thumbnail before the the po the podcast the live stream started. Um, yeah, I guess that she she traded in all of her Bitcoin for a te and and bought a Tesla. I don't know. I so I, I don't know if you guys watch Sarah's videos on a regular. Uh, I do, and she's a friend, and I like her a lot, and. Um, just her whole, I've just been kind of watching her really struggle with living in New York through the COVID thing and, and like, 
and all all that kind of stuff. And they, I, she and her her fiance have just moved down to Texas, and they're you know they've uprooted their whole lives, and they've got to you know when you move from New York to any place else, you have to like reconfigure your life for the rest of America. Like you have to have a car. It has to you have to be able to drive places. It's really, it's really. It's really weird. So I've been interested in seeing her kind of seeing her videos, just talking about like the struggles, because yeah, you know, she. I don't think she's said like really specifically, but you can tell that there's like anxiety, depression, like all all the kinds of stuff that that you can have. And having li lived in New York City uh, during during a real time of of crisis, like you know during nine eleven, and the city just has a has a real a real weird, I mean, not, not a bad, a lot of times, a lot of times in New York, when there, when there's a crisis, you know, the, the best in the people in the city comes out and everybody supports everybody, but it's still like a relatively closed in space. You know, you're on an Island that's 10 miles long and like two miles wide at its widest. And you've got millions of people stuck, like stuck there. And then you're dealing with a pandemic. I can, I can totally understand how that would be really, really difficult. Um, so, so she's been kind of chronicling, chronicling that and the struggles that it's, it's had, um, uh, the struggles that it's brought to like her doing her YouTube thing and all that. So, yeah. Uh, and I think she's living in the Dallas area, so there should be plenty of charging available, <laughs> uh, as opposed to here in Iowa where, I, I mean, if there was, if there was like real, if it was realistic to be able to charge and, and travel as much as my wife does we probably would have added tesla you know a couple of years ago but we don't and every time i look at them i'm like it's like it's like going to a fancy furniture store and being like oh that furniture is really awesome it would be really cool to hang out on that furniture and and just have that furniture be a part of your life and then you just have that sort of like reality check of there's no way that i'm going to be able to have that furniture right now so yeah. Um, remember when Bitcoin was a scam? Uh, <laughs> I'm st like, I have to admit, I'm I'm mathematically challenged to begin with, and I really don't understand how Bitcoin or any of this like blockchain whatever stuff works. Like the story of the guy who sold. I guess he had taken a picture every day and put it online for some ungodly number of years. And, and he put together a collage in, in a JPEG and sold it for $69 million, $69 million, uh, which is just, he sold a JPEG for $69 million. I mean, the, the NFT thing, and it's an NFT, right? So. Um, I, and, and I, I understand the NFT conceptually, but I still have this real issue with like re uh, reconciling an NFT as a, as a unique non-fungible thing that still doesn't really exist. I mean, it's, it's, it's a virtual thing. And then that brings into question, like, well, don't virtual things exist it's, I don't know. Do they? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> and, and the thing, the thing is like, so $69 million for, for an NFT of this, of this collage. Um, also Justine has a Mercedes GLE. Ooh, so fancy. Um, I, and, and don't take this as me like making, you know, making fun of or joking about or, or being dismissive of e either Sarah or Justine. They are both friends and I like them both quite a bit. Um, but sometimes it, like, especially Justine, you know, her, her adventures are like larger than life somehow. So I just, I just really enjoy, um, and I just really enjoy Justine's adventures. <laughs> fungible um so it's non-fungible uh that's a, so like an nft is non-fungible uh what's i forget what the t stands for um 
but yeah, fungible is one of my favorite words that I've never got to use nearly this much. Um, <laughs> I've never got to use this uh, nearly as much. And it's, it's, it's a word that I've known for a while, but I had to like remind myself of the, of the meaning. So a non-fungible token. Yes, that's right. Non-fungible token. And something about the NFT thing really makes me feel like I'm living in a cyberpunk novel now. Um, you know, like this $69 million JPEG um, would be something that a character from a, from a, from a William Gibson book would steal and then that would be the plot, the plot device. So I don't, I, I don't know. It's, it's going to be really interesting to see uh, how it's, how it all pans out. I mean, it's really on the upside from the people that I've talked to. The upside is that it is a potential way for artists to, to. You know, for the artist's work to have value over and above like the the very fungible aspect like you know streaming service and all that kind of stuff so it 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 makes it gives another potential revenue stream to artists for for them to sell their work um so i'm 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 curious to see where it goes but at the same time it just seems weird like i think we talked last week about the fact that the kings of leon release their record as an NFT. And I, I'm just kind of like, um, would anyone, who would want a non-fungible token of a Kings of Leon record? I mean, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, but there's, there's nothing more fungible than the Kings of Leon. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> oh man. But, so Gaylord shelled out for the AirPods Max coming next week. Good luck, man. I, I hope you got a color other than white because I, I've noticed that the white the white makes me nervous. Mine aren't mine are like uh you know yeah. But but I'm actually I'm selling mine, but it's in no way a, a, a sort of it's in no way a judgment against the AirPods Max. It's just that I have so many headphones everywhere, and I'm starting to lose my mind. And so, <laughs> um, so I, I, you get to a point when you're doing this YouTube thing, suddenly like your whole house is just filled with stuff, and and it's time to. It's time to, like, you know, get rid of some of it. So that's that's what I'm going to do. The NBA, uh, the NBA, or someone does NFTs for NBA moments or something like. This. See, that's that's odd because couldn't you just watch the replay on ESPN? How could you? How could you package? a moment in a, in an NFT. I, I mean, I guess I could see the potential for it, but I don't know. I don't know. That sounds, that sounds bizarre. Yeah. We, everybody knows that the, it, it, it's very, it's very, uh, like the, there's the, the footprint of, you know, making the cars and then, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's better than nothing. That's that's what I'll say about about electric vehicles. Um, eventually, everything will be electric, uh, but uh, you know everything costs uh, costs resources. So I, I think I think that moving in that direction is not going to be like suddenly we're perfectly we're perfectly carbon neutral or anything like that. It, but it's but it's a good step. It's a good step. Um, Time to Marie Kondo my space. I got to tell you, man, I, I, I like you know minimalist whatever as as much as as much as anybody. I mean, I wear black every day because it makes my life easier, and and I try. I'm like a min a minimalist who can't stop himself from being a maximalist. Like there's just always so much crap around me. 
And I, I desperately want for there to not be so much crap. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, at Marie Kondo though, that make, makes me nervous. Like the whole like, okay, so the form of depression that I have is called dysthymia. And dysthymia is as the easiest way to describe it is it's like a like a low level of depression at all times. Sometimes there's peaks, sometimes there's valleys, but for the most part, you're depressed like all the time on a on a on a like a baseline level. So whenever Marie Kondo says, you know, does this bring you joy? I'm like, dude, nothing brings me joy. So <laughs> So how am I supposed to answer that? I'd throw away everything. I, you know, no, that's that's an overstatement. But the thing is, like, um, I, I think, well, I understand it from a from a whole a whole like philosophy standpoint. But I think there are easier ways to do it. And have you noticed, like, so Matt Diavella is a guy who who sort of became well known. Uh, as like a, a minimalist, he's kind of moved away from from that, and is like now now sort of just an overall sort of life coach kind of guy, I guess, like a Thomas Frank kind of thing. Um, and so, I, I I just think that all 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 good things in 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 moderation, right? I like you can't go all one way or all the other way, but sometimes I feel like. No matter what I try, I'm just still still like just overwhelmed with crap. <laughs> um, so yeah, <laughs> hydroelectric dams. I, I power all my dams with hydroelectricity. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, pure minimalism is like a rich person thing. Um. I, I guess in a way, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely an upper middle class thing. And I, th I think it's really interesting when you talk about minimalism and you see the people who, who practice minimalism and what it is that they're reacting to that makes them want to practice minimalism. It's like, it's, it's conspicuous consumption, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hydroelect hydroelectric hot dams. That's right. That's right. Um, Conspicuous consumption is what I think, and and just the whole the whole the whole culture around conspicuous consumption is what is what makes a lot of people sort of look to the whole minimalist idea as a way to break that cycle. If you're if you're um, if you're not somebody who can buy whatever you want, um, then you don't have that problem, right? It's it's the people who, you know, can go out on the weekend and and buy whatever you know, buy whatever they want, whenever they want, um, and then some of those people, you know, react to that. And I don't think it's a bad thing to react to that. I mean, conspicuous consumption is is a is a not a good thing. Again, all things in moderation is a great way to think about your life. So if you're so I know myself as a, as a as an addictive person, a person who is easily addicted to things and will easily transfer those addictions to other things. I know that, you know, I was addicted to smoking cigarettes and I was, uh, you know, addicted to drinking alcohol and I'm just as much addicted to buying stuff as I am anything else. And so I know that I need to keep that in in my mind. And, and so, you know, the, the minimalist thing is, is a, is a, is a mechanism by which to do that. Right. So, so I don't know. I mean, again, it, it, it can't, that's why I see guys like Matt Diavel in there. And there are a few other people who, who, who have become these kind of like these, like, I don't know, 30 something male lifestyle dudes um, Thomas Frank and Matt Diavella and uh, Nate Nathaniel Drew, although I think he's younger. There, there are a bunch of them on YouTube, um, and they all do really good things. But you know, they start out with like how to be a minimalist, and then they and then they sort of like, and then they evolve or devolve into, you know, more life 
less like I don't know. They're all gonna they're all gonna write books about how they can I don't know. Uh, the next step is books. I read recently the uh, subtle art of not giving a fuck, which I thought was actually a really good book. Dead the poets, welcome. Um, yeah, the alcohol thing. I, so a lot of people don't think about it, which is good for them uh, because they probably don't have to. But a lot of people don't have to really think about like the nature of of addiction and and how you become addicted and and what addiction is serving in your brain and how you're using that to um yes they want to be the guru so how your addiction is um is sort of manifesting itself i, I don't think addiction ever goes away um i think there's like a more a more rooted problem in the brain that makes that whole thing um that whole thing uh it's a symptom and not the disease i guess is what i'm saying <sighs> stoicism is underrated i mean but you know whenever <laughs> stoicism also just makes it sound like you're just a grumpy old man right so that's that's but i i stoicism is becoming i i fear stoicism is becoming the new minimalism right so so i don't know i'm glad to see the poets i feel like I feel like since since Zach and Viper left, we you know we've been missing people. I don't know I, I don't know who who's not coming around, but I I feel like we've been missing some people. Although I'm I'm perfectly happy to see all of all of all of you around and having these conversations. I I am enjoying these live streams a lot. Not that I didn't enjoy the other live streams, but I'm enjoying these because you know I just I don't know I I let my brain flow free. <laughs> And go off to whatever. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, stoicism is the new me. I Stoicism. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I get it. I mean, I think all of us could use a little bit more stoicism in our lives, for sure. Because, you know, we, we tend to take things way too seriously. The internet is part and parcel of one of the ways that that happens. Um, and, and if you're, if you're a little bit more stoic, you're not going to, you're not going to swing all over the place, you know, and willy nilly emotionally, like, like people do. So yeah, I, I, don't, I, I think, uh, I think, I, I think that stoicism is, is, is a good thing. I, I just think whenever I'm not a joiner, I, I guess this is the whole thing. I'm not really a joiner. So whenever something becomes, um, when, whenever something becomes like the next something, then I start to like really, <laughs> I start to feel really, really resistant to it because like, I don't know. Um, it, it, it just, uh, but so Yates says, uh, I feel more lonely and depressed than ever before. Nothing brings me joy, and I hate society and culture. Welcome to the club, my friend. Um, I mean, I think I think that this is something that a lot of people feel, for sure. Uh, I know that I feel this um, a lot, and uh, it's really it's really hard to pinpoint i i don't think that i think that we will look back on the 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 pandemic year and we will um and we will recognize exactly how difficult it was for everyone both individually and and like and and collectively and we'll see that i i think that I think that the pandemic year has amplified feelings in me that were already there that just like kind of I was I was able to cope with a little bit more. I don't know if that's the case for you Yates, but yeah, and and it's been incredibly isolating. Uh, I mean these li live streams and and just, you know, doing videos and talking to people in chats and being on Twitter and those kinds of things. All of those things have been really helpful um for me. Like if I didn't have this outlet of just like getting on and and being able to talk back and forth with people then then I would have I don't know maybe I would have read more books which wouldn't be a, a bad thing but I might have also like done something drastic to myself <laughs> to myself 
Um, am I resisting Clubhouse? Yeah, I did the Clubhouse thing for a little while. And I mean, I went into like three or four rooms. And it, it just it just isn't for me. It just isn't for me because like... I don't know. I, I I suppose if I went into different rooms, it would be it would be different. But I went into like YouTube, uh, YouTube and and like social media advice rooms, and I ended up like giving a lot of advice, which isn't necessarily a bad thing at all. I like giving people advice. I like being you know, passing on whatever knowledge I've gained over over time. But at the same time, <laughs> like it's not the best use of my time at this moment if that makes sense um it, it's you know so so i just i just want to be I, I just want to be a little bit more a little bit more precious with my time and do things that that are gonna that are gonna continue to benefit me because i got a long way to go on this on this journey in order to be you know stable in, in the business and growing and etc 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 so yeah um Yeah, and Yates, I'm I'm not I'm not saying that you know you you are feeling feeling that suicidal or anything like that. Um, I'm just saying I think I just think that you know the pandemic has amplified a lot of a lot of this stuff for a lot of people. Yeah, I I had to I had to mute a few people uh, at the height of of Clubhouse. I don't know if Clubhouse is still at its height. But I, I, I muted a few people on Twitter because I just didn't want to see like nine, nine to five clubhouse, you know, 24 seven clubhouse, um, clubhouse is a steak spice. Yes. But that's not what we're talking about. This is a new, like audio only social media platform, which is intriguing. I, I agree. Um, clubhouse is very intriguing, but yeah, this there is a lot of smartest guy in the room itis and it's smartest guy in the room itis from like from the people that if you're in a youtube room the people that you would expect to be the smartest guy in the room have the smartest guy in the room itis are the people who do and i'm i'm going to be totally honest whenever i'm in that kind of situation i am i am one of those guys and i don't necessarily like being one of those guys and so that's another another part of it um but I, but I think ultimately with, with clubhouse, the, the interesting thing with clubhouse is going to be like, can it scale? I, I think it's a really interesting way for, for brands and, and individuals. And, you know, I think it's, it's a way to democratize somebody's ability to, to, to speak to people one on, you know, like in a, in a group, um, I, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it can scale the way that it, the way that it does. Um, and the thing is like, like, like a said, he, he likes, he likes clubhouse rooms that are just chill. I, see for me, like I've got a group of guys that I play, I play games with. And a lot of times, like that's where I get my, my chill randomness is just, you know, hanging out, playing games. Which reminds me, that's another thing that I want to start doing. I want to start streaming more more game stuff. I don't care if anybody really wants to watch me play games. Honestly, I just, you know, I enjoy the the interaction with people in the live stream, and I play the games, and I want to do more of that. Like I'm, I'm a Twitch affiliate, and I I haven't streamed on Twitch in over a year. So part of the reason is like I can't I can't simulcast. I can't stream on Twitch at the same time I stream on YouTube because as a Twitch affiliate, that's like against the terms of service. Anyway, somebody was asking about the death of the HomePod earlier, and I, and I do want to talk about death of the HomePod. Um, and, and, I also, and I also want to talk about these rumors for AirPods 3, right? But uh, I did promise that we would talk a little bit about the March Madness. Um, I am not going to fill out a bracket because I, I know how my bracket will end. And I feel like I, I just don't want to jinx it. 
I don't want to jinx it. I love this West Virginia basketball team that we got this year. Um, and, and I'm really excited to watch them play. I don't, I don't, you, you never know what's going to happen in the course of like a whole long tournament like that. So who knows, but I I've watched this West Virginia team all year and, and I know that they have on, on their good days, they can, they can beat anybody else who's playing in the tournament. So we'll just have to see. I mean, there are a lot of good teams out there, but whenever I fill out a bracket, I always feel like I'm, I'm, I'm jinxing. <laughs> Now, I don't want to talk about OSU. I don't want to talk about Oklahoma State because I don't know what happened there. But, yeah, we might have to play them, though, because we're in the same bracket. So if we get to, I think, the Sweet 16, we might have to play Oklahoma State again. But things balance out. You know, if if, if they've beat us twice this year and we've beat them once, I, I like our odds. I like our odds. <laughs> So as as it goes for the home pod though I I really I really don't understand why the home pod I I don't understand the the thinking here because Apple had just added that home theater feature and I fully expected them to rope the the AirPods or the home pod minis into that and um and I, I just thought that that I thought that they would be the the foundation of Apple's sort of home theater thing, and then I just have a feeling that a they didn't sell enough, and b um, they couldn't drop. The, I I think that they just couldn't drop the price enough to make them attractive enough for people to buy them over things that were cheaper. Um, that plus the fact that, you know, they were, they were hobbled by Apple's desire to keep them specifically within the Apple ecosystem. Now, I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I think that you can have a lot more control and a lot, a lot better feature set. If, uh, if you do keep things sort of under one roof, but, um, but yeah, I, I just think maybe Apple, you know, they just didn't see they didn't see a roadmap toward actually turning a profit with them. Whereas the HomePod Mini, see the, the thing with the HomePod Mini is, it ha- they have they have the benefit of all the research that they did for the HomePod that they could then apply to building the HomePod Mini, right? And that makes the 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 opportunity cost, the, the cost that it, you know, all the research, whenever you develop a new product like the home pod, you know, those that five years worth of research, plus all the facilities that they built and all the people that they had to pay and all the materials that had to come and go and all that kind of stuff, all the designs, all the, all the prototypes, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff has to get paid for when you're selling the product before the product can really be seen as a, as a su- success. And I think ultimately for the HomePod, it was just it was just a bridge too far. Like they could they couldn't sell it at three fifty, they couldn't sell it at three hundred, they couldn't make back that original nut and make a profit in a in a reasonable enough time for, time frame to be able to to be able to justify keeping it going. But I do think. As Ace says here, I do think that there might be the opportunity for like a retooled HomePod, um, one that they put together using you know some of the information that they got from the first one, and maybe building it you know with more efficiencies, things that don't have to be there do have to be there, and all of that. I think that there's, I think that there's a lot that they can do, but I think ultimately. Um, I, I think ultimately they're they're gonna have to with Siri. Siri can be what what the HomePod had the potential to be was was the hub of like the the HomeKit ecosystem that that runs your house, right? Siri at that time was not smart enough in that device to be able to do that, and HomeKit 
like the smart home thing wasn't mature enough to really to really be there. Um, so I think I think that Siri Siri was good at doing individual things with the HomePod. Like if you ask Siri to to play, you know, if you ask Siri to play something, she would play it. But if you asked her to do complex things, she couldn't do it. So it yeah, and. I'll I'll take that. I haven't had a chance to watch your video about it yet. I've just I've been like totally swamped. Um, but yeah, it it definitely was a flop, and it's kind of a it's kind of a drag because I wasn't happy with it as a product when it first came out, but as it developed, I I started to like it more and more, and as it had more use cases and and it, it became a little bit more refined here and there, I started to see real potential for the HomePod. Um, but yeah, I, I think Bob's got a good point there. The chips that Apple has now that they didn't have then, like the, the U one and, uh, you know, the stuff that they're using in, in the AirPods and stuff like that. I, I think that there are probably ways that they could retool the home pod and, and make it, and make it something a lot more attractive. But the real question is, is there a market for that kind of like not giant but not tiny smart speaker I mean the home pod sounded great um, Sonos play ones and the Sonos one and all those things sound great Sonos play fives sound amazing um, but is there really a market for that stuff because like I said in the video that I made the other day I feel like as you know as Apple was putting out the home pod, Google and, and and Amazon were transitioning to devices with screens and that that became like a whole different thing and I think that ultimately there weren't there aren't enough people who care enough about like really good sound quality to sell enough of those things to make it to make it worthwhile I, I don't know. I mean, maybe my faith in people is, is, is too harsh, but I just don't feel like people care about like high fidelity enough to really, you know, make a big deal about the difference between an echo and a, and a, and a home pod, right. Or Sonos. I mean, Sonos kind of had that market already sewn up. Uh, if you wanted, if you wanted whole home audio, then Sonos was the system to go with. They were already there. They had already like very deeply developed that system for themselves. So Apple was trying to compete both with Sonos and with Google and, and Amazon, and they just got stuck in the middle somewhere. And, and I think, I think, you know, tech for your needs, your point, your point is a good one. And I think it, it kind of dovetails with what I just said, which is that I think, the majority of the of the people on looking at the market the majority of people were saying it needs to be like you know google home or it needs to be like an echo and then there are other people saying it it needs to perform like a sonos and i think apple just got stuck in the middle they didn't make something that performed as well as a as well as like the the google or amazon ecosystem and they were on par with Sonos. Uh, I think they were close enough that you could say it was like it was a it was a toss up between one person's taste to another person's taste, which one sounded better. And I I tend to like Sonos a little bit better overall, but I really was seeing um, the potential of the HomePod growing. Um, so. So I don't know. I think they got caught in the middle. And then uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll dad tech with another super chat, dude. I appreciate it. I really do. Um, so people want a smart speaker first and then something that will fill the room with. Okay. Audio second. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. The home pod was the antithesis antithesis of what the market wanted. And that's why it flopped. I, I think I think it was a little bit of that, but I also think that so in in Apple's perfect world, everything is like mid-century modern. 
and and like really sleek and the home pod sits there and it elegantly plays out the music and i think they had this this vision of of what the modern home would be and then there's like the reality of what the modern home is <laughs> and and like there just there was too much space in between for the home pod now roberto roberto says here you know home pod flop because of uh, because of bluetooth no bluetooth and i'll agree with that i mean bluetooth was a feature that a lot of people relied on um the thing is like i didn't really mind that there was no bluetooth i mean because i'd already been using sonos and sonos doesn't really do bluetooth either so sonos was a closed network home pod closed network i was used to that mindset right and and so it didn't bother me all that much, but I can certainly see how it would be bothersome to a lot of people and it would cut a lot of people out of the market for a home pod. Now, I mean, one of the frustrating things like, so I'm, I'm using this S galaxy S 21 ultra right now, and I'm using Apple music on it. But when I'm, when I go to Apple music and I want to stream something from Apple music to, <laughs> to a a device somewhere else i hit this and it only notices like my my chromecast devices so i can't even i can't even go from apple music to my home pods on on an android machine i can't i can't do it so that's that's frustrating cuz like i really wanted to i really wanted to hear this song earlier this song Black Crows, Thorn in My Pride. Oh, it's a good song. I was it came on as I was getting out of the car last night, and I I was like, well, I'll listen to it on the home pods while I'm sitting here unboxing this TV that I unboxed, and it wouldn't. I couldn't get it to play. Couldn't get it to play. So annoying. And then there was the price, as as Jermaine says. Uh, the price. The price. I mean. In in terms of Apple, I don't think it was surprising that it cost that much, but I think that there were enough products that were almost that were good enough that were significantly cheaper that you know it it didn't have like like the the smart speaker the 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 smart whatever you want to call it doesn't have the place in the marketplace that a, a headphone does right headphones have a very specific place in the market and you can get cheap headphones and you can get expensive headphones and so apple can play in the expensive headphone market with the airpods uh the airpods max and and maybe get away with it but when you know you've got when you've got a, a, a amazon echo that's 99 bucks and then you've got a $350 home pod and the majority of people are not going to really notice that much of a difference between one or the other. And one's going to listen to them and tell them things more readily than the other. And the other one's going to play Spotify. <laughs> then, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, it, it was not a good, well, I understand. I, I, I guess I understand why they did it, but um, I understand why they did it the way they did it, but I don't think, I don't think they fully understood the market by the time they got there. Cause you got to, if they were developing that thing for five years and then they release it, I mean, wherever they started five years before, whatever they thought it was going to be, and then moved through those five years. I mean, half a decade of tech is like 20 years. So I just don't think that they could pivot and make it something that fit the marketplace a little bit better because of what had they had done up to that point. So it'll be it would be really interesting to like be a fly on the wall and and hear the real reasons why um the home pod got yanked. I but yeah, I mean I I think I think Apple might have gone a little bit too um apple 
on the home pod and and you know honestly they may have done the same thing with the airpods max we'll just have to wait and see um we the airpods max i mean right now they there's like used airpods max are selling on ebay for brand new prices and there are some people who are trying to like raise the price but like when i put mine on ebay they suggested 549 as the, as the price that i put them up i'm like well i i don't know i'll do it and see what happens most likely i'll go in and like lower it here in a day or so but that just goes to show you like the market for the home the airpods max is still really strong because there's just not enough stock right um and i think ace you have a good point too that in the five years between when they first initiated the HomePod project and when the <laughs> and when the HomePod came out, I do think that they probably were expecting Siri to be more of a thing. Um, so, yeah, it's it's one of those products where if you were to buy it at launch you you have to be like 100% in the tank for apple right you got apple music you use siri exclusively you all your devices are apple etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. like you had to be totally in the tank for apple for that for that device to work for you and even then i don't know if a lot of people who were totally in the tank for apple would would still feel like it was the best purchase for that price the mini though um the mini is different i think the mini at 99 dollars see there are there are certain price points that are triggers for purchase decisions among among the unwashed buying public and 99 dollars for a tech product is one of those trigger prices right where you see it and you see it's apple and you see it's 99 dollars, and you're like oh i can afford that and it's apple right so i have one i've been using it it gets loud it sounds full i don't feel like i, I don't feel like i'm listening to a tiny speaker you know it's like remember the original google homes those little pucks those things sounded awful just terrible they were they were bad and so i i remember thinking like nobody would ever want to listen to this thing the mini is not that much i mean it, in terms of volume it might not be any bigger than the original google home but it sounds really good. And I will say that every time that I've asked Siri to do something on it, it does it, you know? So, I mean, I'm not asking, I'm not asking the world, <laughs> you know, I'm just like play Ray Charles and it does it, you know? So, so yeah, I, <laughs> oh man. So it's funny. I don't know if you guys have watched this. Uh, so I, I I read the book. No, actually, I listened to the 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 audio books of Stephen King's Mister Mercedes, and then the two books that came after it. So I started watching the series, and uh, one of the characters uh, works as a as like a as a I guess the equivalent of like a Geek Squad guy at a at a second a second rate electronic store and they have like the geek squad type car but it's a it's a pt cruiser <laughs> which that's the kind of attention to detail that i really appreciate you know they they can't even be cool enough to get the volkswagens they've got to get the pt cruiser it's and it's set in 2009 so it works um but that series written and directed by david david e kelly uh, we've got Dennis Lehane as an, an executive producer along with Stephen King. And I mean, there's, there's some good people behind that. Uh, I will have to say that the first three episodes, maybe it's because I've read the book and I kind of know where the story's going. It's felt a little slow, 
but uh but yeah mr mercedes if you I, i'm watching it on peacock uh when they moved the office over to peacock my daughter and i had not yet finished watching all of the office so we had to go to peacock and peacock has some other kind of cool stuff one of which being mr mercedes so that's what i've been watching recently um i've kind of been in a dry spell although i did watch this this movie the other night uh, kind of an indie movie. It's been a long time since I chose to watch an indie movie because I get really emotional when I watch movies. And you know, sometimes you'd, I'd rather watch, I'd rather watch like a stupid action movie or horror movie and not get emotional. <laughs> but, uh, but at the same time, like I watched this movie uh, called yellow rose. It's about a, a teenage girl who, you know, is on, undocumented in texas and you know there's great music scene down there and she's like she loves country music and and so she it's it's a really good movie centers around like texas texas style country music and uh dale watson who's a great who's a great performer songwriter uh singer is in it you know the the broken spoke which is a famous austin uh club is in there so but uh, but yeah, it's uh, so I, I I've been watching that. But I got to tell you, so I got I don't know if you guys saw on uh on the Twitters today, but I got that TCL six series TV uh, that TCL uh, sent to me, and it's got mini LEDs, and and it's uh it's gonna be like so I've still I basically set it up. My house is too small to set up two 65 inch TVs side by side. So I put, I set it up in front of the uh, in front of the LG C9 OLED TV, and and Zack Snyder's uh, Justice League is gonna be is gonna be like the the first real test, and then of course March Madness basketball, and I'll have to put it through all the other paces of the Blade Runners and all that kind of thing, but um, but so far I I just had it set up for an hour or two before I started the stream. So far, this TCL TV is is seriously the real deal. Um, I've been very, very impressed with the picture quality. Um, you're getting QLED micro LED. I I don't know. It's it's dark out now, so I'll be able to really see um, one of the. I'll, I'll be able to see a little bit more how it performs in like my regular TV watching place, but. Uh, but yeah, and Dale Watson is one of the greats. Uh, man, people like Dale Watson. Um, yeah, uh, there's like that whole alternative country scene that's just been percolating down there in the underbelly of music for almost going on 50 years now. And uh, Dale Watson's one of the greats for sure. Um, So, hold on, I'm reading here, sorry. The Yorkies, the Yorkie pud. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to make the text bigger to make sure that I was saying it. it says, I have both the mini and two HomePods for a TV. Uh, you know, find a bizarre killing off the HomePod without upgrading. Uh, they will probably sell some uh, sub $200 uh, and pair them up to the mini. I, see, this is a question. Because I heard that right after they announced that they were that they were uh, getting rid of the HomePods, that they were discontinuing them, that the Space Gray HomePods on Apple's website sold out immediately. I haven't checked. I haven't looked. I haven't. I haven't looked to see if there are more available elsewhere or anything like that. But um, but yeah, it's it is a it is a weird choice, and I. When I initially saw the news, I thought they've discontinued the HomePod. They're having an event on the 23rd, supposedly. So maybe that means that we'll get HomePod 2.0 on the 23rd. But I don't know that Apple usually does things in that in that order. You know, usually they'll 
they'll announce the new thing and, and then discontinue the old thing uh, is usually the way that they do stuff. So we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Um, Kong versus Godzilla. Yeah, that might, that might be. That'll be good, too. See, the thing, that last Godzilla movie is one of the best movies. It's kind of like the, uh, the Battle of Winterfell episode of Game of Thrones. If you want to see how well your TV handles darks, <laughs> like if, you're, if your TV can handle the contrast of like really, really dark scenes. Um, I remember watching the Battle, Battle of Winterfell and I had the OLED TV and then I went on Twitter and everybody was like, I can't see anything. I can't see anything. And, and I was like, I, I could see it. <laughs> And um, and so that for the last Godzilla movie was like that too. I remember watching it. I forget where I was, but I watched it on on a TV that wasn't mine, and um, and I couldn't see anything. I couldn't see anything. So yeah, my stimulus check is supposed to be in the bank tomorrow. We'll see. We'll see. Um, <laughs> we'll see. yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know what to say about this whole stimulus thing, but I do know that we're reaching two hours. I've been, I, I, I recorded three videos today and I've been talking for two hours. So um, I think I'm going to, I'm going to end it here. People I'm going to end it here. Uh, you know, uh, press the button for the outro music, I, which I haven't set up yet. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'm going to be done for the, for this evening. I'm going to go kick back, get myself a nice cool glass of uh, Mio uh, cherry blackberry flavor and, and maybe a small, a tiny ice cream cone. <laughs> because I, I, did I tell you that I went to the doctor and I stepped on the scale and I saw a number that I it was nowhere near any number that I'd ever seen before. And now I'm like, I got to stop being such a fat bastard. So I'm eating like tiny ice cream cones as a, as a little treat. Anyway, uh, you guys have been awesome. Thanks so much for being here. Once again, uh, you know, my name is Jason. This is Painfully Honest Tech, the tech that's so honest it hurts. This has been a live episode of me yakking on and on ad nauseum about whatever it is that came to my brain with the help of you guys out there uh, just giving me material. Until the next time, I'm out. <laughs>